My name is Jen Chambers. As I said earlier, I am a uh, class of 2001 from the Trinity School of Arts and Sciences. Um, I graduated with a degree in theater and now I work back at Duke. I am the Assistant Vice President of Lifelong Learning in the Alumni Engagement and Development Office. I've been back at Duke for about seven years um, and it's really wonderful to be back at the Gothic Wonderland. Um, I oversee uh, the programming that we are going to be uh, enjoying today. This is the Forever Learning Institute, which we also have integrated into this year's reunion program. We had four sessions this week. I hope you've had the chance to, to join in for some of the other options that we had earlier on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Um, for today's session, I am delighted to welcome uh, Dean Ravi Bellamkanda, who is the Vinick Dean of the Pratt School of Engineering. He's been with us since uh, 2016 and has been uh, leading the Pratt School through some amazing transformative transformative sessions um, in the last few years. As somebody who graduated uh, in the arts and sciences side, I didn't make it over to the engineering school as a student, but I have the great opportunities to go over there now and see amazing lectures and see the energy of the students. And it's really been amazing to see what you've done um, in your five years at Pratt. So with that, I will turn it over to you to lead today's session um, in technology. Jen, thank you so much, and uh, good good afternoon to everybody. Uh, if you're in the Pacific time, uh, good morning to you all. Uh, it is an incredible time in healthcare uh, and for Duke, um, as you all know. And and today's session will will uh, reveal. I hope uh, it's uh, an extraordinary time in terms of technology and the role it plays generally in our society, but particularly in healthcare. Uh, we will hear today from our guests about the revolution and possibilities of data science and how it's impacting us and how we can see patterns that we didn't see before um, about the uh, advent and rise of mobile architecture. So uh, we can uh, get data from uh, our handhelds and smartphones um, and also about exciting developments to diagnose uh, at home and point of care technologies as they're called uh, to just empower patients in a way that was uh, or individuals in ways that was previously not possible, as well as the exciting things happening in imaging and amazing technologies to help us diagnose diseases earlier, which we couldn't, we needed advanced, advanced techniques to do so. So it's a really exciting time in terms of technology and the role it's playing in medicine. The other two exciting things about it for our audience here and for us as a community is that Duke is at the forefront of all of these things. And we'll hear from experts today in a short while uh, about that. And lastly, the other thing you'll notice, I hope, is that if you look at our panelists and where they come from, Duke is an extraordinarily collaborative place in terms of the nursing school, the medical school, the engineering school, all working together with our clinical enterprise to do this. So it's a fantastic place to be. So what I'll do now is um, ask each of our panelists uh, if, if they're not... Uh, to, if, to turn their videos on and uh, audio systems on, and maybe just say uh, one or two lines uh, introducing themselves. We'll start with Adrian, go to Ryan, go to Tosh, and then to uh, Sharon. Uh, just a line about yourself and where you're from, and then we'll start off our first presentation from Adrian after that. Uh, so Adrian? Yep, hey, it's uh, great to hear, uh, be uh, here with everyone. I'm Adrian Hernandez, a, a cardiologist at Duke and a director of the Duke Clinical Research Institute. And so I've had the pleasure of actually going across the campus, uh, meeting people as we're trying to solve problems around healthcare. And so uh, it's been an exciting time and I did my uh, training here. And so I kind of see how things have changed over the last 20 years. Right. Hi, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Ryan. I'm Ryan Shaw. I'm a um, associate professor at the Duke at the Duke um, Nursing School. I also direct the Duke Mobile App Gateway over at the over at the um, a medical school. I do um, research in uh, um, digital health. Um, I received my um, a PhD here at Duke in um, 2012. Um, and yeah, and um, thank you very much for you know um, having me here. Thank you, Ryan. Tosh. Hi, I'm Tosh Chilkori. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering and chair of the department at Duke. I work in a number of different areas, but I think what's re relevant today is our work in point of care tests. How can we take a single drop of blood and squeeze out as much information as we can as fast as cheaply? And I'll show you an example or two today. Show you that 
you know, we've come a long way. There's still a long way to go, but I think a lot more is possible in terms of empowering people to take care, diagnose their own health. That's an intriguing concept. Sharon? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sharon Fekrat, and I'm a professor of ophthalmology and a retina surgeon here at Duke. I've been here for 22 years. <laughs> Um, I'm really excited to share some of our work with you today on behalf of the iMind Research Group. Um, I lead a very large multidisciplinary throughout Duke and multi-institutional clinical research group for the last four years. Um, and I'm gonna tell you all about some of our exciting work today. All right, so we have some superstars with us. <laughs> Adrian, lead us off, please. While Adrian is pulling up his slides, uh, you'll have a chance to submit questions in the chat and we'll wait for all the presentations to be over to take questions, if that's all right with you. Okay, uh, well, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, so what I'll uh, start us off with is <clears throat> where we are at Duke in terms of getting human intuition, meeting AI and turning into human intelligence. And so I'll just um, start uh, first as kind of reflect on the last year what did you observe that was previously impossible? And then also, what did you do that was previously impossible? And this last year has been transformational for all sorts of reasons. While there's been certain challenges around COVID-19, it is certainly an unlocked and accelerated things that were needed to address the pandemic. Now in this background, uh, Duke has been working on a lot of different areas that are specifically relevant to issues around the pandemic. And because of our position now, we were able to address lots of different things for um, COVID-19. Now I'll just share one story here in terms of uh, something that actually started before the pandemic in terms of things that we were doing in cardiology that we thought were impossible that are now possible today. And so my story was uh, walking uh, just uh, from the hospital over to the engineering building and discussing what we were doing in terms of routine clinical care. And it was very vivid that moment when I described how we take care of patients with heart attacks, how we do an echo to image their heart, how we do a cardiac catheterization to actually look at the arteries and see if they have blockages. And to hear the engineers and the data scientists in that room saying, you know that's barbaric medicine. We can do a lot more than what you're doing right now and just eyeballing these images. And we can actually do things that are even more automated and actually deliver better quality of care. And so that kind of started the story in terms of what my involvement has been trying to push um, and with our colleagues across campus of how we can um, bring in AI and data science into human intuition and make it highly relevant. Now in the COVID context, uh, there's been a lot that has been done in this area. And the question for all of us is what will stick post COVID-19? And what you'll hear later are things in, uh, in terms of technologies approaches that um, we have been doing over the many years but are accelerating. And what we see is actually likely to stick uh, post COVID-19. And so it is this question of what can we take advantage of in terms of accelerated shifts to make them stick and have a larger impact as opposed to things that just worked for now or um, somehow could be at risk for going back to the status quo. Now just reflect on what has happened the past year and outside of healthcare or health or research. There are a lot of things that have happened in so-called consumer behavior, telemedicine, working from home, getting information in different ways, having people have deliveries at home that they never imagined could be done, doing things at home in terms of digital exercise, all sorts of things. In the background of that actually comes technology to orient people in terms of preferences that they may have and or abilities that they and capabilities that they didn't have access to before, but it has been accelerated in the past year. And this is uh, what's been fun about Duke is uh, working with multiple disciplines, people who are experts, leaders in their field, where we're having this combination of efforts in terms of healthcare delivery, taking care of patients, preventing people from being patients, being able to apply new technologies, artificial intelligence. We're constantly surrounded by data, but how to use it in the most effective way is often challenging. And we often miss the big picture because we don't see the whole picture here. 
And so what you'll hear today are examples of how all those things have been put together. And so I'll just kind of start with some basics here. Every day when we take care of patients uh, in, the, in Duke Hospital or in the clinic, um, we are putting information to electronic health records. Terabytes are created every day around uh, patients and their health. How we actually use it, consume it, is still a major challenge. But the advances in terms of AI make it much, much better in terms of being able to harness that information into action. And some examples of this is that uh, routine x-rays, for example, things that we may have missed before can now be picked up in terms of automatic image captioning and being able to do something that's gonna pick up things that maybe it's not our focus for someone's health condition, but may really be important for their future health or actually accelerate what we need to do in terms of uh, healthcare or be more efficient in our, our activities. Another example that's still emerging is how we can take advantage of natural language processing. This has been uh, highlighted in a New Yorker article uh, in 2019, but advancing what we can do in terms of the context, the, what's information that's hidden in the notes uh, that can be informative and actually make things more efficient for people's uh, health and health care. And then soon, like, you know, be able to simply translate our discussions with patients and being able to automate not only kind of understanding diagnoses, <clears throat> but also be able to so-called transcribe this into information that is pertinent for other care deliver, uh, health care deliverers, as well as uh, the patients or their families. And then now, just added to that is what I call sensor galore. And you'll hear some highlights about that, where these things that we carry around are phones, how they can bring information about our daily lives or how we interact. And so, for example, now you can have ability to understand if you've been exposed to COVID-19 because of who you may have been around um, or understand early signals, uh, say, for COVID-19 because of how your behavior or cardiac activity may change or your sleep patterns. And now this is all coming together where the technologies of different areas, genomics and microbiome, your environmental exposures, behaviors, other clinical tests that can be done efficiently and other information can really paint the picture of all of you or the whole of you so we can get more proactive in terms of health and healthcare. And so uh, now we have this marriage of what can we do operationally for a healthcare delivery that can be optimized and take advantage of new technologies getting information from a drop of blood, being able to digitally interact with someone at their home at their convenience, and being able to use data that's not only within our healthcare system, but outside the healthcare system that may matter to a person, and then being able to optimize it to, towards their health that matters the most to them. So I'll stop here and we'll turn it over to Ryan, uh, who will take us into uh, more about uh, digital. Oh, um, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna let me bring this up here real quick. All right, so I'm gonna I'm going to I'm I'm going to I'm gonna briefly talk about um, digital health and also um, telehealth, and more from a um, care delivery um, standpoint. So these are our these are our um, patients. They are um, connected, but they're not just um, younger. They're also um, older adults too. And recent um, statistics show that this is true. Almost everybody owns a, at least a, um, a basic phone. And increasingly over 85% um, of the US adult population owns a um, smartphone. And this really um, transcends um, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, racial, racial, and also and the, the different backgrounds there. And the, um, the, and the, and the um, biggest thing here is that we were able to often directly um, reach people using these, using these um, tools almost um, wherever um, they are with potential um, a promise to be able to collect um, health data closer to the um, places where we see health um, happening, which is for the most part, not within a um, clinic or in the um, hospital. In increasingly people have, um, do also have um, in-home um, broadband too, but there are some um, disparities there. So what digital um, health is, is it um, connects and it empowers people and also um, populations to manage health and to manage 
um, wellness to create what we call digitally enabled care environments, in which we use digital tools to transform healthcare, healthcare um, delivery. And so I, I think of this from a um, data standpoint. In, in many ways, data that we would um, traditionally collect within a, a you know, within a um, clinic, we can now begin to collect in many other um, ways in where um, patients are throughout their you know, um, daily um, environments. And this might include things such as um, surveys that you could collect on a phone, maybe through the patient, patient um, portal, could be um, sensors on the phone, but also um, connected devices like um, wearables, um, glucometers, um, blood pressure cuffs. There's even electro, there's even these um, six lead, these um, six lead, six lead um, EKGs. Um, there's also, um, we also have um, in-home devices such as um, voice-based um, AI. We think about um, Google and also um, Siri, Alexa, and increasingly environmental um, sensors too. In other words, we can collect many new kinds of these um, data from, um, from um, uh, patients. And we are able to apply these in many um, different ways. Um, it could be through um, telehealth, which I will um, talk a bit more about, but we are increasingly seeing the home as the um, care site. You know, we see things like these um, hospital at um, home um, programs where we are able to deliver a certain amount of say, um, of this, of this um, acute care that we would normally do in the um, hospital. And we can do some of it while people are, are at are really at um, home. And in this case, you might get this, um, you might get this um, iPad that has multiple um, devices that are, you know, um, that are, um, that are um, uh, connected to it. We can get, we can um, remotely monitor um, vital signs. Um, we can do um, video-based um, telehealth, but it doesn't mean that we don't send um, clinicians into people's um, home too. You can send a you know a nurse to the um, home to draw um, labs to collect um, vital signs. We can send we can send um, physicians into the um, home too. So in many ways, where we were um, previously um, fearful that maybe um, technology would make healthcare um, cold because people don't necessarily want to be taken care of by a um, robot. What we are seeing is this um, transformation where um, healthcare is actually coming um, closer to um, populations. And we are better able to get insight from the day-to-day -day health of our um, patients. Um, and this is big business too. We're seeing um, companies get into this. If you've heard of maybe um, Teladoc, Amazon Care, and also um, Walmart too. And during the, um, during the um, pandemic, this has really um, ballooned. If you remember about a year ago, we were really um, rushing to be able to deliver care at a um, distance. We were trying to prevent um, patients from um, coming into clinics, coming into the coming into the into the um, hospital. And I heard from I heard from from um, physicians all over the country that they had never delivered um, telehealth prior to COVID nineteen, and now um, it's part of the, part of their um, a practice. Now this did spike and it, it has gone back down. We are back to delivering in-person care, but it's here to um, stick in some form or in, in um, some fashion. And um, a part of that is that there is a reimbursement around um, telehealth, um, particularly right now during the um, COVID-19 public health emergency. Uh, there's, it's still to be determined how much of that is going to be um, sustained. There is also um, funding that was um, poured in to be able to deliver um, telehealth, te te telehealth um, services. And the Duke Health System is also um, part of this too. And we're also doing um, research in, in, in um, these areas too. And I'm just going to um, share with you um, one study that, that, that um, we are about to launch. We call this extend expanding um, technology enabled um, chronic cr chronic um, a disease um, care. Um, I I'll leave this with my my um, co colleague Dr. Dr. Um, Matthew um, Crowley, and this is team based um, telehealth with mobile um, monitoring. We engage um, patients who have multiple um, chronic um, illnesses, in this case uncontrolled um, diabetes 
and also um, hypertension, which are particularly complex to, to um, uh, manage and having them come into the clinic every three to um, six, six um, every three to six um, months just isn't quite enough um, care. Um, and so our uh, previous work shows that just through nurse delivered um, telehealth alone, we can improve um, health outcomes in this, in this um, a population. Um, and we can also give people monitoring um, devices for them to be able to collect to collect to collect um, health data on their um, diabetes. And so in this two-arm randomized controlled trial, we give um, one group a suite of these um, devices to monitor glucose, weight, um, blood pressure, activity, and we pull that data into Duke's electronic um, health record. And they self-manage with these um, devices. And the goal is that we can use these um, data to have better um, insight into really um, what is um, happening in between these, these, um, these different, these different um, in between um, clinic um, visits. And now those who are then um, randomized to the um, second group go into a telehealth care delivery um, model that is team um, based where a, um, a physician is going to um, prescribe them to essentially receive this um, biweekly nurse delivered um, telehealth. It's all um, evidence-based. The nurse reviews um, data from the multiple um, devices during that um, encounter. They compile a note within the, um, within the um, electronic um, health record and they send it to a, a, um, to, a to the um, pharmacist. And the um, pharmacist um, titrates and helps with the with the um, patient's um, medication um, uh, management. So the idea here is is really between um, clinic um, visits, they are um, getting this more intensive um, care, with our um, goals to improve um, health outcomes, um, hemoglobin A1C, um, a blood pressure. We're also looking at how we can um, implement this and also um, scale it. We're looking at cost versus re reimbursement. And what I think is the most interesting is that we believe that the, that the um, data from multiple devices plus from the um, electronic um, health record, there's signal in there in which we can um, likely um, predict um, clinical events like urgent care, emergency, department visits, maybe even um, hospitalization. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much. I'm gonna, I'm going to, I'm gonna pass it on over to um, Tosh, thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and let me find my, Well, thank everybody for the questions so far. Keep them coming and we'll get to them in the end. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. Sorry for the delay. So thank you all. Uh, this is I'm Tosh Chilkoti, and I'm going to pivot a little bit and actually show you how we can build using off-the-shelf components, really sort of simple diagnostics tests that will work from a drop of blood, where you can simply take a drop of your own blood with a finger stick, load it up in a cassette, and in less than an hour. Uh, you can, for example, diagnose if you have antibodies against COVID-19, if you were thought you were sick, if you've been vaccinated and you want to actually track how your immunity is developing. So, um, so one of the most common tests that are used in the clinic to diagnose diseases is called the sandwich test. This was invented about 40 years ago. It's a trillion, uh, it's generated trillions of dollars of revenues for companies. It's been used, I don't know, hundreds of millions of times, or probably even more. And in this test, this Y-shaped molecule, this Y, this antibody is put on a surface. You attach it to a surface. Then you sort of put a drop of liquid, urine, saliva, blood, serum, plasma. And the hope and the, and the test works by the fact that this antibody has been very carefully designed or selected to only bind a molecule of interest from this complex mixture. And this molecule of interest is what you're interested in as a marker for a disease. So let's say blood or serum has all these different molecules. The antibody will only capture these blue, blue circles, which would be a protein, for example, whose concentration or level goes up when you're sick. 
And if it goes up, you know you're sick. And based on how much is present, you know how sick you are. And doc, that's the kind of information doctors need. To, to complete the assay then, after this molecule binds, then you have to wash the surface. Then you come in with a second antibody that binds to a different part of the same molecule. But this antibody now has a label, has something you can see, something that, for example, emits light like fluorescence. So we call this a sandwich amino assay because it relies on a molecule being sandwiched between two antibodies that bind to different parts of the molecule of interest. The first molecule is on the surface, the second molecule is introduced from solution, and it brings in a signal. This is a really fantastic technology uh, and is widely used, but the problem with it is it is not so cheap and it takes a big complex analyzer because it has many moving parts, it has different steps. You have to add the sample, then you have to wash it, then you have to block the surface, then you have to add a second antibody, on and on and on. And these are the kinds of detectors that are used, devices, they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, they are bulky, they're expensive, and uh, they typically sit in centralized labs and hospitals. When I started working on this problem, I sort of had this naive belief that technology has advanced enough that we should be able to really, really simplify it by bringing together ideas from different disciplines, from protein engineering, from polymer science, from microfluidics, and from the design of low-cost optical components. And that's what I hope to show you today. The first problem we had to solve is that this is the assay I showed you. Here we're looking at three, we're trying to detect three different things, a green ball, a red ball, this orange ball. And we're making this kind of sandwich assay. In an ideal assay, only the green ball binds here, the red binds here, the orange binds here, and then only this antibody binds here and so on. The truth is, this is what happens because every surface attracts molecules. So instead of just an ideal sandwich, this guy can, sorry, this guy can bind here, this guy can bind to the surface, this guy can bind to the surface, then this can bind to this, or this can just bind directly to this. So you get this sort of mess on the surface. And this problem is especially acute when you work from complex mixtures like plasma, and it is even worse when you work from blood. In blood, all hell breaks loose because not, you don't just have proteins, you also have cells that can stick, the blood can clot, so it's been a real challenge in how to build these kinds of tests that will work from blood in a very simple way that don't require really complex instrumentation. And our approach was the following. We first said we need to solve this problem of everything sticking everywhere. So we had invented, when we got into this field, the reason we got in was because we had invented this coating, this poegma coating. What it is is nothing but a nanoscale carpet. We take a glass slide, we attach a molecule to the surface and from that molecule, we grow trees. We, so we plant seeds and we grow trees and the trees have branches where the branches have this really wonderful property that they will prevent anything non-specifically sticking. So proteins will not stick to the surface. Cells will not stick to the surface. Now that we have a complete non-stick surface, we then build our assay on top of it, which is nothing but the sandwich amino assay where I will be first inkjet print the first antibody, the capture antibody. Then we inkjet print by doing a line scan, raster scan, a trehalose pad. Trehalose is something that dissolves very easily in, in water or in blood. On top of this trehalose pad, we pinch print a detection antibody. These are the, this is the second antibody that makes the sandwich that brings in the colored signal, the light that you wanna see if you have a positive diagnosis. And so this is a really simple test because now, first of all, I'm manufacturing everything using inkjet printer. I start with glass, I grow this, carpet of polymer, which is very cheap polymer. We can build it really fast. And then I use, just use an inkjet printer and print spots of the capture antibody, inkjet print the trehalose pad, inkjet print the detection antibody, and we're ready to roll. All you have to do now is dispense a drop of blood. The blood dissolves the trehalose, liberating the detection antibodies. The analyte, the molecule you want to detect, the sort of molecule in green, diffuses as is the detection antibody and you complete the sandwich. What we've now done is we have printed everything on the surface and a single drop of blood unleashes a chain of events that leads to a sandwich being formed and colored spots appearing. How does this work? We just published a paper in Science Translational Medicine last week showing that we can actually now, if the stars are aligned, if we have a good marker, if we can find great antibodies, and with using our sort of great non-stick surface, we can now build protein-based tests that in the best case possible can even beat PCR. Polymerase chain reaction has been the gold standard for detection in many cases, because in PCR, a single molecule of DNA or RNA can be amplified a billion times. 
And it's very tough to beat the technology because of its built-in amplification cap capability. But in this case, the stars were aligned for us and we built a test where we could detect, if you look at this data here. So here's the chip, here's the detector. This is an old detector, it's, we've squeezed it down. The detector is handheld, weighs a few pounds. It uses a touchscreen computer that we buy from China. And the parts are all, the parts are all 3D, are printed uh, using 3D printing. It uses a cheap LED laser and a filter. The whole detector is built by a single graduate student and it costs us less than a thousand dollars. This detector can actually meet a sort of clinical analyzer. And so here you see a dose response curve, these two S-shaped curves, and, and the, the, the inflection point tells you how sensitive the test is. Using a 150,000, about 70 pound detector that, weighs, that costs $150,000, you have a detection limit of 0 0.06 nanograms per mil. In our case, uh, we get a detection limit of 0 0.05 nanograms per mil. These two numbers are the same. There's really no difference. But the point is, this costs $150,000. This costs $1,000. This is 70 pounds. This is a few pounds. With this detector and this test, we could detect Ebola at day four, and PCR only detected it at day seven. So this is a best case situation. In this case, we detected it by uh, you know, three days earlier than PCR, which is sort of pretty unheard of. This is because we had a very good sensitive marker that we had identified whose levels as shown here of this protein you know, they start out day minus eight is eight days before infection and the monkeys are infected. This is at three days, four days, seven days, 10 days. The red circle means we detect, we can detect by our assay, but not by PCR. Black means we can detect by both. And we could clearly detect all four monkeys at day four, and we couldn't detect a single one by PCR at day four, but by day seven, we could detect Ebola infection in all the monkeys uh, by the seventh day. Uh, this is not just useful for Ebola. Uh, hopefully, Ebola will never show up in the States. But we last year, when, when COVID-19 hit, my entire lab pivoted to working on COVID-19. One of the challenges we had to solve was we wanted to also, if you're going to work with blood, we wanted biocontainment. We wanted to make sure that the blood was completely contained, that once you load up the blood onto the chip, it's not sort of there. It can't, you can't create an aerosol. You can't create any sort of danger to the person doing the test. So this is... One of the things we've done in the last year, we created a self-contained microfluidic chip. This little hole here, if you can see it on the left, this vertical slide, this is where you load your sample, your blood. The blood will drain here and fill up these, this, these two hourglass figures. At the same time, after you load up one drop of blood from a finger stick, that's about 30 microliters, you will also load up about three times the volume of buffer or saline solution. Uh, you add the blood here, and then you add the buffer here, and this sequence of images on the top actually shows an assay that is running. The blood is completely contained in these channels and is then drained at the end of the test in this pad. It's like a cotton pad. So you, you, the blood comes in from here, fills this up at time zero, and then the buffer comes in from the top from here and starts to drain out the blood, pushes the blood out. By 43 minutes, all the blood is drained, and all the blood and buffer is collected in this pad. And then that you can then take this cassette, this, this cassette, pull it out, put it in the detector and image it. The test is actually printed in this region here in the bottom hourglass. We did this, we took this test, the, these chips and the detector to the ICU at Duke. And we worked with an MD-PhD student who was, who was sort of volunteering her time. And this is actually real data from patients admitted to the ICU at Duke where they'd been admitted, they were sick. And the question was, are they developing antibodies to COVID-19 or not? So here are five healthy, four healthy individuals. Uh, by our test, they have no antibodies against COVID-19. Here are five people in the ICU. They all had antibodies against, against uh, COVID-19. In fact, they had antibodies against different proteins that are uh, in on the, on the surface of the virus or inside the virus. So this is a simple test that took less than 45 minutes to run from a single drop of blood. At the end of it, we could you know, tell you if, if you have antibodies against COVID-19 um, or if you don't and, and the levels. Uh, so this was really important early on in the sense that you know, we wanted to sort of find out how are people going to respond? If they, could, if they develop antibodies and high levels of antibodies, they're likely to be protective, they're likely to fare better. If they have very low levels, that's dangerous. But now that we've sort of pivoted into the vaccination phase, this kind of test is really important because we can, we can send thousands, tens of thousands of these tests out into the community. Schools, clinics, hospitals, you know, you name it, YMCA's gyms, and people can be tested for the, for the development of antibodies after um, they're vaccinated. So we can actually start to track the emergence of immunity in the population 
um, post-vaccination. I'm gonna stop here, thank the people who did the work, the many funding agencies that funded us. Uh, thank you for listening and I'd be glad to take questions after we are done. And um, so thank you all. And I'd like to now hand over to Sharon Fekrat. Let me stop sharing and Sharon, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I will share my screen. Okay. Well, very good. Um, I'm going to pivot and <laughs> yet again and talk about um, a very different space that's not related to COVID-19. So a picture is worth a thousand pixels. Okay, let's see if we can go to the next slide. We'll do that. Okay. Could your poor memory be due to Alzheimer's disease? Or is it just normal aging? Or could it even be another type of dementia? Well, you can actually find out, but what you'd have to do is you'd have to get a brain PET scan, which you can see down here. Here's a picture of the very large machine, and you can get some radioactive tracer injected into your bloodstream. And then you can get a scan of your brain that can tell you if you have amyloid. However, there are some challenges with this. The, the brain PET scanner is not available at everywhere. The tracer is incredibly expensive. And to get this test, it's not currently uh, reimbursed by insurance. So most people say, mm, no, thank you. I'm not gonna get a brain PET scan to look for amyloid in my brain. So what else can you do? Because it's not easy to diagnose Alzheimer's disease um, with certainty, and there's really no easy way. So what are some of our other options? Well, you can say, if I'm not gonna get a brain PET scan to look for amyloid, how about a spinal tap? So here you can see on the top left, somebody getting a spinal tap to get some cerebrospinal fluid that bathes our brain and our spinal cord. And you might say, mm, that needle is a little too close to my spinal cord. No, thanks, I'm not gonna do that either. Well, how about just a simple blood test? Well, a lot of the tests, um, although they're improving to help diagnose Alzheimer's disease, th they're not that sensitive and specific. Well, how about just a standard MRI of your brain? Uh, we get MRIs of our knees and our shoulders. How about we just go get one of our brain to figure out if our memory challenges are related to Alzheimer's? Um, but that's not specific either. You know, we may see shrinkage of our brain over time and enlargement of these ventricles in our brain, um, but it's really not very specific for Alzheimer's dementia. So instead, doctors rely on clinical symptoms and criteria without getting additional tests. And one out of three times, the diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's disease is actually wrong. So subjects in the, all those clinical trials that are going on right now, they may not even have Alzheimer's disease. In fact, it's been shown that a third of patients with Alzheimer's disease referred to enter a clinical trial, they did not even have amyloid in their brain on their PET scan. And amyloid in the brain is a known biomarker for Alzheimer's disease. So maybe it, that's why over 400 clinical trials studying new treatments for Alzheimer's disease have failed. Maybe some subjects in those studies don't even have Alzheimer's disease. Maybe they don't have amyloid in their brain, or maybe the Alzheimer's is just too advanced for any of these new treatments to really show an effect. So we need an easier way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease before symptoms start so that Alzheimer's patients enter Alzheimer's clinical trials earlier when novel treatments may actually work. So maybe the answer to that is right in front of our eyes. Now that technology has just exploded, there are so many ways to get very good images of the eye that are non-invasive. So they're not as invasive as a brain PET scan. 
There's no radiation. There's no, nothing injected into your veins. It's very inexpensive. It's covered by insurance. It's easy to obtain. It's widely available. Most of these uh, imaging cameras that we are using in our research are available in doctor's offices, eye doctor's offices. And the resolution is incredible. Down here on the bottom left, you can see um, one of the imaging scans that we get. And it looks at these little blood vessels in the retina. There are five microns in diameter. So not even a millimeter, there are five microns in diameter, which is thinner than a human hair. And so we have been studying what we call multimodal retinal and optic nerve imaging, where we can look at something called a retinal nerve fiber layer. We can look at the ganglion cell layer of the retina. This is a uh, optical cross section of a retina um, that was also developed in part here by our engineers at Duke. Um, we can get maps of blood vessel density. We can look at the entire retina and measure all these vessels. So it's a very, very exciting time with this explosion of imaging technology of the retina and the optic nerve. And so we know that our eyes are direct extensions of our brain. And as a result, our eyes are windows, not only to our soul, but they're windows to our brain health. And this um, picture really shows us how our eyes are indeed extensions of our brain. And so changes that we see in the blood vessels in the retina or the wallpaper of the back of the eye, very likely mirror changes in the very small blood vessels and the structure of the brain. So I wanna share this really interesting um, story with you that sort of got us started on all of this in 2017. So here with permission, I have pictures of some of two of my patients. They are identical twins. Um, and at that time they were 96 years old. So they're identical twins. That means they have the same DNA, but yet one of them had very advanced Alzheimer's disease. Yet the other one, did not. In fact, she lived independently, used a smartphone, drove, talked about current events, um, very, very sharp. So we decided that this was an opportunity in 2017 to get some of these uh, imaging pictures uh, that are worth a thousand pixels um, of their eyes. So that's exactly what we did. And what we found is that the uh, cognitively intact uh, identical twin had a uh, vessel density mapped map that looked like this. And the more blue and green there are, the thinner and loss of the blood vessels in the retina, these small blood vessels that are five microns in diameter. And so of course, this is not entirely normal. There are aging changes, but they were the same age and had the same DNA. And over here, you can see there was much more blue and a much lower vessel density in the identical twin with Alzheimer's disease. So since then we have been forging ahead and we have not looked back at all. <laughs> and so um, some of our pilot data is shown here, which is very exciting to us. So we looked at 70 eyes of those with Alzheimer's disease and compared them to 254 uh, cognitively healthy control eyes. And with this positive p-value, we found a decrease in the retinal vessel density in those with Alzheimer's that was significant compared to cognitively healthy controls. We also found decreased retinal vessel density in those with Alzheimer's disease compared to those with, uh, who have mild cognitive impairment, which is thought to be a precursor in some cases to Alzheimer's disease. And you can see these color maps that show the differences. We did not actually find a difference in cognitively healthy controls and mild cognitive impairment. And that could be that we need more eyes than just 72 eyes with mild cognitive impairment because MCI is sort of a mixed bag of diagnoses sometimes. So we are busy collecting that. But what we did, and one of the benefits of Duke is the experts in so many different fields. And so we have been collaborating 
with the Duke engineers and many other individuals at Duke in neurology and statistics and radiology. And together, we have built um, a deep learning model, which is a type of artificial intelligence. And we have fed some of our imaging inputs, as you can see here at the bottom, into this um, deep learning model. And this model was uh, able to differentiate those with symptomatic Alzheimer's from cognitively healthy controls 84% of the time. So we, this keeps us up at night. And so here's an example of somebody with symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. And these are the imaging inputs that went into the deep learning AI or artificial intelligence model that I just showed you. And the deep learning model said that the probability of this person having symptomatic Alzheimer's was 96%. And this is a cognitively healthy control. And these are some images that we put in. And this purple image here actually is an attention map or heat map that is trying to tell us what this deep learning model is actually paying attention to. And this deep learning model said the probability of this person not having Alzheimer's was 99%. Um, so this is something that we're working on. We are on the yellow brick road. We have an incredibly large team that we have called iMind. Um, and here are some of the, the groups that are working with us. And so we're very excited to hope one day be able to take some of these images, for example, on a smartphone and send them up to the cloud, put them through our deep learning algorithm and produce a predictive score that might say, yes, you should go see a neurologist for further evaluation, um, sort of like a cholesterol panel or, or lipid profile that can predict the risk of heart disease. Um, so there's so much more than meets the eye and we're really excited to um, share that with you today on behalf of the iMind Research Group. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you to all the speakers and thank you uh, for uh, the attendees uh, for submitting questions. Um, really thought provoking each, each of our presentations. Um, if I may, I'll start off with some questions and then we'll also incorporate the audience questions. Um, first, um, you know, there is a general concern about all of this data and Adrian, you refer to multimodal data, not just uh, sensor, but our, our blood genomic data and all of this. How should we think about uh, misuse of such data uh, or ethical concerns with uh, such data for insurance purposes or an employer saying, well, you know, we have all this more information on you, so your payment will be higher than somebody else or other kinds of misuse. Um, you know, if you take off your clinician hat and put on your citizen hat, how do you think about such things? Yeah, no, so that's a, um, a, a central importance for all of us. And so especially, you know, as technology is not going to be the limitation, it'll be the kind of bright ideas of how to apply it. And so you know, we work closely with uh, people across Duke who are paying attention to not only kind of the ethics of um, these technologies and using AI, but also experts in, say, cybersecurity privacy to ensure that we protect the data so that it's used in a, in a, in a, under governance that will clearly um, provide the benefits of learning um, but and protect about, uh, against some of the misuse. And so we work across only within the campus but also across other healthcare systems to actually make sure that we're forging new ground in an ethical way that would matter to individuals and not just to the populations. Yeah, so I'm, 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 um, so we can come back to this question. I'm sure some others in the audience may want to follow up on both the security and hacking kinds of concerns, as well as the use concerns of the data and how we not cross lines uh, in our enthusiasm to, to help uh, that, that are troublesome. Um, I'll also switch to another line of questioning. Uh, increasingly, Ryan, perhaps you could take this with your mobility thing. You know, everybody's excited about the Apple Watch and its designation by the FDA for, you know, heart rate monitoring and things like this. And there's an explosion of wearables everywhere and people are saying, selling you <laughs> all sorts of data. How actionable or what is the quality of wearable data? Uh, is it really actionable? Because you mentioned all these different ways of collecting data in your study. 
Um, and how far away are we from actually getting data that's actionable clinically uh, instead of just making me feel good that my heart rate is low or high? You know, could you comment on that? Where are we technology wise? And as a researcher and clinician, would you use the data in any interesting way? Great um, question. You know, and it really just um, depends on the type of device and the type of data that we are being um, that is being collected to, right? So we are we have to um, balance between what is data um, quality versus being able to make decisions upon um, individual um, data points versus say um, trends. And so I think physical activity is kind of a you know um, easier um, uh, thing to think 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 about here. Your um, daily act, uh, activity probably isn't that important, but we could look at it across a week, across a month, and then we can make better, you know, we can make more um, inferences into how people's um, lifestyle is. And so we have to do that with every single um, data point too, especially um, weight too, right? Our um, weight um, fluctuates throughout the day. So we have to kind of make um, decisions on how we can use data. So um, something that might need like, you know, um, FDA approval, like a um, glucometer goes under more scrutiny than um, something that does not require um, FDA approval. But I, I, I would say we are um, close to be able to using data for um, clinical um, decision. We just have to do it well. Could I, could I also ask you, you mentioned telehealth in your talk. Um, are there incentives appropriate for driving costs, because I remember uh, the reimbursement I, I heard somewhere, and is this true, that the reimbursement for a visit, let's say, for you to see a patient is lower in tele versus physical. And are there wrong incentives in our hospital care system to actually not do telehealth and see people in person? So what, what are your thoughts on that, if you don't mind? Or Adrian can chip in too here, uh, you know, if he wants. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm curious to um, hear from, you know, from maybe um, Adrian also um, Sharon on that, uh, but yeah. Here, yeah, so uh, it's interesting. So uh, certainly um, reimbursement matters. Uh, that's if you, there are two things that move um, healthcare, doing the right things for mother's family and, and also money. And so uh, in this setting, um, you can get to a more efficient process by digital methods and telehealth. And so it's better for the patient experience. It's more convenient and so forth. And so payers are seeing this. And so they are, um, and many are aiming to incorporate this as part of uh, the payment structure, as long as it can be more efficient, more economically valuable uh, to all stakeholders uh, or in population health. Um, that's also where we see that it's of high value uh, and patient center. Understand. Um, if I may, Tosh, the next question, if I could direct to you, uh, it is really intriguing to hear about the possibility of a drop of blood, but unfortunately, there's been a really bad story about the drop of blood in diagnostics in California, as you may well know, uh, about hype around that. Um, could you tell us, you know, the, 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 the future you, uh, you, you, you paint is interesting, where I could, as a patient or an individual, in my home, get to know a lot of information if the technologies, like, like you mentioned, uh, take off. Um, realistically, where are we with this uh, for common things like, uh, uh, you know, for blood sugar monitoring, we've already been doing this, right? So we monitor blood sugar easily. Where are we with other things in your mind, just from your lab as well as other minds? And then there was a question about your work and our use of primates in certain yep. select situations. If you could also comment on the ethics of that, um, sure. one of our attendees rightly pointed out concerns about that, to which sure. I also saw that you had responded. If you wouldn't mind uh, taking sure. those two on. So, I mean, point of care tests already exist. I mean, there are some that are actually used in cardiology, but the one that most people are familiar with is a lateral flow assay, the strip test. Most people know it as a pregnancy test, right? That's sort of the most common use, but there are other flavors of the strip test, lateral flow tests that are used to diagnose other diseases, uh, but they're limited. They're limited because uh, they're qualitative, they're yes, no. So for pregnancy, yes, no works just fine. But for many diseases, doctors would like more information than that. And they tend to work really well from urine, for example. Urine is easy to work with, uh, but even when you get a saliva, it gets more complicated and blood, of course, is the worst. So 
you know, I, I think, you know, the, the adoption of point of care has been slow in the US for many reasons, which are actually regulatory, which are the way a healthcare system is structured, reimbursement. I'm not an expert, but I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, but when you think about healthcare needs globally, which is where I like to look at it, there is an absolute need. And I think this crisis, this pandemic has really highlighted the need for rapid cheap diagnostics. I mean, we thought we could do PCR in the US and it'd be just fine. Well, we were proven wrong as a nation. Even the United States of America, one of the wealthiest, most technologically advanced nations, people were waiting five days, up to five days to get the results, right? That's simply unacceptable. And I think that I think technologies have progressed to the point where we can do much better and we should do much better. And it takes a public health crisis for us to wake up. And once we wake up, then this America, this country can do great things as we've known. That's the answer to your first question, a bit convoluted and I may have digressed, I apologize. With respect to non-human primate testing, yes, uh, I know it seems horrible and it is horrible, but I do want to point out, I'm not making excuses here. We didn't kill any monkeys for our experiments. You know, it would be absolutely, I would have found it personally distressing to have launched a study to test my little device where monkeys would have died, right? Because that's sort of, we actually went, there are very few places where Monk, people work with monkeys, especially with things like Ebola. It's a BSL-4 lab, it's in Galveston, it's one of the few approved labs. They do studies for a lot of people. We piggybacked onto existing studies where they were actually testing vaccines and drugs. So the only way you can test a vaccine or a drug for Ebola is to infect the monkey, but the hope is to save enough monkeys. We got our data from the monkeys that were called the control arm. That was sort of, you know, there has to be a control arm when monkeys are infected, not treated. That's where our data came from. So that's why if you look at the data carefully, it's kind of spotty. It's like, why four monkeys? Why day four? Why day seven? We just had to do whatever they were doing and get samples. So yes, I would. I, I completely share your sensibilities. With respect to animal testing, there is a huge need and huge interest from the NIH and researchers in trying to get rid of animal testing. We are not there yet. Technologies are being developed, but it'll take time. Science is unfortunately sometimes painfully slow. But things are speeding up. We have things called lab, you know, we have things like organ on a chip technology that's coming up, organoid technology, which is getting closer and closer to mimicking the human body. And I think, you know, it's already being used actually to do some drug testing. And I think that use will increase and hopefully we will get to a point where not a single animal will be sacrificed so that we can be saved from diseases. So we've made sort of a, you know, this is an this is unhappy truth. This is what we've done for over a century but we realize that we should be able to do better than that. And I think we will. I appreciate that, Tosha. That is a, a nuanced answer and we can have a longer conversation on that. If I may ask uh, Dr. Fekret uh, a question about um, early diagnosis, it is really, I, love, I loved your talk and the images. Um, could you tell me just off the bat at the high level, if we are able to detect Alzheimer's early, which is a big if, and I hope we are, are we able to do something about it that's, uh, that's useful? Or uh, do we have treatments? You mentioned clinical trials, and we still don't know if we have therapies or not, because we're not able to detect definitively. But if we were able to, is there a way to change the course of the disease in your understanding? Or would is it, a two, it's, I would still like to know, so I can plan my life, I suppose. But where are we with that, if you don't mind? Right. So I think, you know, in science and technology, so many things are happening in parallel. So as we're trying to learn to diagnose Alzheimer's more accurately and earlier, there are novel treatments that are being um, looked at and researched. So if someone were to know at age 40 that they had a 85% risk of developing Alzheimer's, they may do some things. So there's, there's no medication or pill they can take at the moment, but they can do exercise. So if they were like, oh, I'm going to exercise tomorrow, nah, next week, I'll start next week. But if they knew they had an 85% chance of developing Alzheimer's, then they would get outside hopefully and do that exercise because exercise does increase the size of our hippocampus, which then delays and I guess provides a bigger hippocampus. So in Alzheimer's, as the hippocampus gets smaller, you have longer to go. So it delays the onset. Um, but then they could maybe join clinical trials early and, and help us find a treatment. No, I understand. Knowing is the first step to doing anything. And so I appreciate mm -hmm. that. You also mentioned uh, 
as I grow older, I, I, I am getting forgetful, as my wife reminds me, uh, particularly when it comes to shopping and things. Uh, um, so I make lists now. But um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit. So if I have other kinds of memory loss, and you mentioned hippocampus, but does that also change blood vessel density? And it's just subtle and our techniques are not good enough to pick that up because we are picking up gross changes or big changes with Alzheimer's, especially as it progresses in, in, in the example. So is, is blood vessel density a decent marker somehow as a proxy, which you're detecting for general memory related issues or cognition related issues? Well, so I'll answer it this way. So two things, um, with aging, our memory is not as good. And with aging, we do see a decreased retinal vessel density. And we have published on that. And so it's very important to control for age as we assess um, the changes that we're seeing in individuals with cognitive impairment. Um, so that's very, very important. Um, and, and we are doing that. No, I appreciate um, it. And yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, please. I didn't mean to interrupt. Please go ahead if you're finishing your thought. Oh, um, and so all of our studies so far have been cross-sectional. So it's just a moment in time. And we are currently um, developing follow-up and collecting follow-up data to follow patients longitudinally so that we can see the changes over time and look at rate of change and compare that to normal aging. So we still have a lot of work to do on our yellow brick road. I understand. I have one other question and then we can go to other questions. Jen, if you wouldn't mind looking. The question I had was, uh, Dr. Fakrat, when you mentioned uh, your collaboration with Duke Engineers and Adrian mentioned the collaboration with Duke Engineers and Ryan mentioned this. So how off the shelf is the quality of analytics and AI that we're doing? So if I were, a, if I lived somewhere else, and somebody told me, my clinician told me, hey, I'm using AI algorithms to do X, Y, Z. And the quality of those, that AI part is all over the place because it's, not, it's all custom. So Duke has its researchers who apply its technologies and techniques, whereas in Arizona, someone may do something else. So how far away are we from some kind of comfort and standards, standardization on the analytical side of the techniques that we're using. Adrian, I don't know if you wanna take this as opposed to Duke specific one. Or, so if you do a trial in such a thing, can I only do it at Duke or would we have to take our algorithms to other places or do they have their own? How, how does this work? It seems like a you know, crazy wild west type situation with the AI stuff. And I'm just wondering where we are. Um, yes, yeah, so I could just say that some of it depends on the inputs. So the algorithm, you know, is software, so that can be shared and be widely available, and we can just send the images here or to the cloud. But our algorithm is specific to the inputs that go into it, so it would need they would need to be standardized um, at that juncture. Wait, Adrian, do you want to? Yeah, the, uh, the way I like to describe it is that. Uh, just like we have different languages across the world and different dialects, so does healthcare. And so it's not only kind of like, you know, the inputs as Sharon notes in terms of like the unstructured data that we uh, have or can potentially have available, um, but, but also the behavioral patterns, the practice patterns. And so uh, we, we've seen this in our own work and where we work across a number of health systems uh, we, we were shocked at one point in a, a large study they were leading uh, that uh, we were diagnosing heart attacks differently than somewhere else, something that's been around for decades. And so, and so we were thought, thinking that, wow, how is that possible? And, but it was just because of how we, people have different patterns or behavior patterns about how they diagnose, how they um, describe it, how they document it, et cetera. And so those are examples where um, as AI broadens out, it is important to actually validate um, in different settings and different contexts because the people are different, the, the environment may be different. And so you always want to so-called recalibrate um, these uh, approaches. I appreciate that. I have one follow-up question uh, that this, this, this set of presentations come to me and I'm following the questions. I hope, I hope I'm 
representing the audience questions as well. Um, how is medical education changing? So I hear that it's very traditional generally, our accreditation, all that stuff is very traditional when we teach medical students. How are we preparing them for this new world of technology-driven mm -hmm. care and data-driven care? Are we, if I know all of us are teachers too, could you comment on that, uh, any one of you perhaps, um, in, in our training of physicians of the future, have we, has our curriculum, the experiences kept, kept up with this world that is, that is being created? Not only that, Ravi, um, actually the people who are coming in as medical students, um, they, they often have a really incredible backgrounds. Uh, computer scientists coming in as uh, students in uh, medical and nursing school. Uh, and people who have backgrounds that they're actually looking to see how can they further apply what they've learned in that area to untapped frontiers. And, you know, unfortunately still healthcare is uh, an untapped uh, frontier. Well, I, I think we have time for one last question. And could I ask that? I think one of you, maybe Ryan, you mentioned Amazon Care. Will, it, will you make a prediction, any one of you, uh, in five or 10 years, if Google or Amazon will be a leading healthcare provider <laughs> competing with Duke hospitals. Is that true, not true, impossible, quick reaction? Because well, of their, would... their, their comfort with data, if, if, if I may, yeah. I would say their care delivery a model is likely to be around in terms of the um, technologies that they are um, setting up. It might be like um, app-based in a virtual care and connecting devices that will be transferred. In terms of the actual um, companies, I don't know, perhaps I'm Adrian. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think what, you know, what we're seeing now is like, um, just like in other industries where they see the potential for AI, they're actually gonna aim to harness it themselves. So healthcare systems, for instance, are going to bring data scientists directly in, into that environment. And uh, the one thing that people don't necessarily realize in the so-called Googles of the world, on the other end of an algorithm is actually a human being. And so, so um, if say you've got your algorithm um, uh, incorrect and you lose so-called ad revenue, um, well, you optimize it for the next day. But if you miss something in terms of human health, then that becomes a tragedy. And so I think that's a perspective that, say, we want to, to remember. And then the other thing, when you have, say, the, the work like, say, Sharon is leading, how do you put it in place in terms of the healthcare delivery chain? You know, and so how to be proactive and preventive to um, prevent downstream effects. And so that is something that, you know, I'll say it's that, what's that human intuition to know where you can place it. Uh, and and I, I see that's a part of the model for healthcare. So, Well, I appreciate it. I think we're at the end of our time. Uh, my thanks again to all of you for your time. And uh, it's uh, wonderful to watch your work progress. My thanks to all the attendees. Let me turn things over to Jen. Um, thank you, Jen, for convening us all. Uh, I hope this was useful. I'll just say to the attendees, I saw some questions there I couldn't get to. I apologize. Please uh, be in touch with Jen and we'll try to uh, connect you as best as we can to follow up. Uh, so Jen, with that, uh, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been fascinating. And what I love most about my job is the opportunity to bring people from across the institution to talk about how their work ties together and what they're looking at, because it really is an interdisciplinary approach to, to research and, and being able to make advancements, particularly in, um, in a research institution. So. With that, I want to thank all of our panelists um, and particularly doc, uh, Dr. Balampanda, who will actually be leaving us um, at the end of the semester to become the provost at Emory University. And many congratulations to you on that amazing uh, next step in your career. Um, we have other programs coming up later this month and next month um, within the FLI. Please check out the upcoming Forever Learning newsletter that will come out next Tuesday for more opportunities for you to engage with the education programs that we offer to our alumni. Thank you so much for those that are enjoying reunions. Enjoy the rest of your weekend programming. And for those that this is the end of your Friday or the middle of your Friday, enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>